Uh, it's now my pleasure um, to introduce our speaker tonight, Professor Tom Henry. And it really is an honor to have Tom here on the uh, occasion of the year of the 500th anniversary of Raphael's death. Um, because uh, Tom is a bona fide world-class Raphael expert. Uh, his day job is a professor of history of art at the University of Kent. Um, until recently, he's been running University of Kent's uh, Roman School, um, though that's currently suspended, um, like so many other programs at this time. Um, but when he's not teaching, he's uh, done some very major curation. The 2012-2013 uh, exhibition on late Raphael at the Louvre, uh, Tom was one of the curators of that, and he's also a co-curator of the currently suspended National Gallery of London Raphael show, uh, suspended because of COVID, but due to go in spring 22, I think. Yeah. Um, so we have in our midst um, uh, a bona fide Raphael specialist who's going to talk to us on the subject of did Raphael have a Florentine period? Question mark. So Tom, over to you. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Simon, and um, thank you, everybody, for being here and to those who are tuning in for tuning in um, as well. Um, I'm very pleased to be back here at the British Institute. I last spoke here, I think, eight years ago on a topic um, about the gifting of cloaks between Renaissance artists. Uh, that was immediately after the uh, Louvre Prado late Raphael exhibition, um, and in, in a way it flowed out of some of those um, researches. Uh, I also want to thank Simon and the Bush Institute for this invitation, uh, for this initiative, and for getting people in a room as well as online. I think we all hanker after um, some return to, to, to normality. Um, I will mention the Raphael exhibition at the National Gallery in London at the very end of this uh, paper. Um, I had anticipated that I would be back in London by now in the middle of the hang uh, because we were due to open on the 3rd of October uh, 2020. Um, I'm now very pleased to say that those dates have been moved to the spring of 2022 and I believe uh, now all loans have been reconfirmed for the uh, subsequent dates. The the topic I want to talk on tonight um, is the question of did Raphael have a Florentine period? And the picture that's already here in my title uh, slide, uh, Raphael's great uh, entombment in the Borghese Gallery in Rome, uh, painted for Atalanta Baglioni's chapel in the Church of San Francesco al Prato in Perugia, uh, is, I think, without out really the masterpiece that Raphael painted in the years 1504 to 8. But it's a masterpiece painted in Perugia. Now pull most studies of Raphael off the shelf and they say that the years 1504 to 8 were Raphael's Florentine period. Look at most exhibition catalogues and they say the same, 1504 to 8, Florence. Uh, although you will also notice in such exhibition catalogues that the sections devoted to the Florentine years, so-called, are often strikingly thin in terms of works that were painted and strikingly full of drawings, often drawings after other artists. Similarly, ask a student to outline Raphael's career, and they will tell you that he worked in Umbro and the Marche up until about 1504, that he was in Florence, 1504 to eight, and Rome from 1508-9 until his death in 1520. So the executive summary of what I want to say today is that I think this is a great oversimplification and I want to give you some reasons for why that um, came about to support my argument that we should think of this 
these years in a different way uh, and to also explain uh, what I think was really going on in that period. Now this is not intended to stir the lion of Florence, but instead perhaps to reinstate the griffin of Perugia. In other words, reclaiming the years 1504 to 8, or at least some of these years, for the principal centre of Raphael's activity at that time, which was Perugia. Now I'm going to talk about the documents that place Raphael in and then outside of Florence uh, in these years, the works and their respective importance in these years, and only later am I going to introduce uh, Vasari into the discussion, but perhaps those who know of Vasari's uh, interests will already anticipate that one reason we have this notion of a Florentine period is that Vasari puts a great deal of emphasis on the importance of a Florentine experience in Raphael's career. So let me leap straight in and let's look at the documents for Raphael in Florence. Now, if people are thinking that this is the moment to go and make a cup of tea, believe me, it doesn't take me long to go through them. Oh, this has stopped wanting to go forward. Do I need to click here? Now it's gone forward, gone forward. Uh, apologies for that. So, documents for Raphael in Florence before 1504. Easy, there are none. Documents for Raphael in Florence in 1504. There are none, although there's a problematic example that I'm going to come back to once I've gone through. Uh, 1505, we have a date on a painting painted uh, for a Florentine patron. I will show that work and perhaps talk about it further then. 1506, nothing. 1507, nothing. And then in 1508, we have a letter written by Raphael from Florence to his uncle in Urbino. Now this letter, very important, I will go and show it. There is the letter and a work that it talks about. And I will go further to the signature, which might actually be the closest we get to Raphael stating uh, a Florentine uh, presence. Um, El rostro Raffaello di Pintore in Fiorenza is how he signs the letter. Now that uh, should give us comfort that at least at that point, he was describing himself as based in Florence. But if you read the letter with a little bit more attention, and I'll go back to the wider slide, the first thing you find out is that he's keeping up with the news in Urbino, that he's asking for paintings to be sent from Urbino to him in Rome. That means he's no longer based in Urbino. And he asked that his key Florentine contact, Tadeo Tadei, the patron of uh, the Lord of Belvedere, which I'll show shortly, uh, be well received on an imminent visit to Urbino. He discusses an altarpiece, which can be identified as the Dei altarpiece, now in the Palazzo Pitti, seen here on the right, uh, saying that he has finished the cartoon for the picture and hopes to complete it soon after Easter, uh, which happened to be very late that year. This is a letter of the 21st of April. Uh, Easter was the 23rd of April that year. He also asks for solicitation in Urbino uh, in pursuit of obtaining another letter of recommendation, and this becomes quite important, uh, from Francesca Maria della Rovere, addressed to Piero Soderini, uh, and this is in regards of una certa stanza da lavorare, a certain room that needs to be worked on or painted. La quale tocca a sua es de allocare, uh, which it is sua es, and I'll go into that, 
um, role to allocate or to commission. Now, there's been a great deal of debate about exactly what's going on. In a nutshell, it seems to be that uh, Raphael already in April 1508 knows that the Pope is decorating the Vatican stanze and he wants to be recommended to join the equipe of painters uh, working there. And he wants essentially to be presented via the uh, Florentine Gonfaloniere, Piero Soderini, in pursuit of that commission. So the very letter that places Raphael in Florence is about him wanting to leave. Now, I'm not going to go back to the slide where I had the years, uh, the, 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 the documents by year. There is another document for 1508, uh, which was introduced into the literature uh, about 10 years ago by a great Florentine scholar, Francesco Cagliotti, uh, regarding the gilding of the Ghirlanda that went around Michelangelo's marble, David, recently completed. Uh, now, there are those who accept this as uh, Raphael accepting a very menial piece of decorative work in Florence and receiving payment in the spring of 1508 for it. And there are those uh, amongst whom I am numbered who object that this is not the kind of work that Raphael was taking on and that the documents do not specify Raffaello di Giovanni Santi da Urbino, instead only giving the first two elements there, Raffaello di Giovanni, and there are, of course, multiple Raphael di Giovanni's in Florence, including one decorative painter, um, Raffaello di Giovanni D'Antonio Riccomani, 1471 to 1545. In other words, uh, it's much more likely that these documents relate to that minor figure. So we've got through the documents for uh, Raphael in Florence up until 1508. After 1508, there is almost nothing. I could have put in here a loan repaid by a Florentine artist, uh, but it's not really germane to the argument. Now, I said that I would come back to the discussion of uh, a letter dated the 1st of October, 1504, normally described as the Giovanna Feltria letter or the Prefetessa letter. Now, this is a letter of introduction written in the terms that you can see on the screen now and that I will read out for, for clarity's sake. The bearer of this will be Raphael, painter of Urbino, who being gifted in his profession has determined to spend some time in Florence in order to learn, per imparare. And because his father, of whom I was very fond, was most worthy and the son is a sensible and well-mannered young man, on both accounts I bear him great love and desire him to attain perfection. Now, this letter is apparently written by Giovanna Feltri della Rovere um, from the Ducal Court at Urbino and is a letter of recommendation written to Piero Soderini in Florence. The problems with this letter are that it, is not record it does not survive in manuscript form. It's only recorded from 1754 onwards uh, when it was published by Bottari. Uh, saying that the original was in the Casa Gadi here in Florence, but it is no longer extant. Now, there are a number of other problems. You will have seen in the translation I just gave that there are some square brackets around the past tense for how the letter speaks of Raphael's father, uh, because in the letter, he speak, the, the, the author speaks of Giovanni Santi in the present tense, despite the fact he had died uh, more than 10 years before. Uh, now that is presumed to be some slip of the, of the pen, essentially. Uh, but it has led to this document being 
frequently excluded from discussion of Raphael's uh, years. And even if it was taken at face value, even if we accept this kind of letter of recommendation is the kind of thing that existed in the period and was commonly used, it still does not make a Florentine period on its own. And rather than leave any shadow of doubt about this, uh, I find too many things convincing in this letter uh, than troubling in this letter. And it seems to me highly likely that this uh, letter did exist uh, and that Raphael was presented in these terms with the idea that he wanted to come to Florence to learn from, to learn what he could in the city. So, moving on, what would we call Raphael's Florentine works? Well, perhaps just as I go into them, I'll do, make this, again, as it were, executive summary of what comes next. I'm going to show you a series of Madonnas and portraits, essentially small, private, domestic works, not major public visible commissions. Uh, in other words, this is, even if working for the elite of Florence, it is not, the, it is not a description of somebody uh, challenging at the very top of the patronage pile in that period. And it's the exact opposite of what we will see in his work for other centres. So these two examples, um, the Terra Nova Madonna on the left in Berlin and the um, Madonna of the Meadow, otherwise known as the Madonna Belvedere in Vienna. These two seem to be both painted for Tadeo Tadei, who was certainly Raphael's most important uh, patron contact in the city of Florence. This picture described by Vasari, and I'll come back to, to Vasari later, um, in a pre-restoration slide, um, the Madonna del Cardolino here in the uh, Uffizi, uh, made for Lorenzo Nasi, and uh, we know well, extremely badly damaged by a landslip on the coast of San Giorgio. The famous portraits of uh, Anula and Maddalena Doni. The Canigiani Madonna in Munich. Uh, a slightly bigger picture, just possibly for a small uh, palace chapel rather than a church setting. And then you get to the day altarpiece, uh, which I showed earlier, left unfinished because Raphael thought it was more important to go and work for the Pope in Rome. Now, these are essentially the works listed by Vasari. There were, of course, many others that can be linked to Florence. Uh, for those who saw the exhibition in the Scuderia del Quirinale celebrating the 500th anniversary of Raphael's death, you will have seen these two works together, the Madonna del Granduca from Florence and the Madonna Tempi from Munich. Uh, there are provenance issues that suggest that both these have a Florentine uh, background and they clearly respond to uh, works by Donatello and by Masaccio that Raphael could study whilst he was in Florence. We then have another portrait, the Lady with the Unicorn in the Borghese Gallery in Rome and on the left hand side a Holy Family in St Petersburg, again with a Florentine provenance. Uh, the two Cooper pictures in Washington uh, the earlier um, on the left uh, and the dated Nicolini Cooper picture of 1508 on the right. These pictures, it's slightly harder to be sure where they were painted from. They're almost, we, we know the picture on the right was painted in 1507 and you'll see that that is the likely period for Raphael's most intense exposure in Florence and on an identical scale the Madonna of the Pinks, um, now in the National Gallery of London, having been rediscovered by Nicholas Penny some 20 years ago. And just to end, um, the Esterhazy Madonna 
possibly painted uh, after a visit to, uh, to Rome with the Forum of Nerva in the left-hand background, and a missing picture, uh, a tondo possibly painted for Siena. And then I did put in two more, the Bridgewater Madonna on the left-hand side in Edinburgh, and the Belle Jardinière in the Louvre uh, with a questionable date between 1507 and 1508, possibly described by Vasari, and I'll come back to that. Now I put in one extra picture here, not that I'm saying that this is uh, Rafa, I think it's certainly not, it's Rodolfo Ghirlandaio, but one thing we will see as we move on to look at Rafa's um, success in Perugia and generally success outside of Florence is the impact he had on other artists there, that he formed intense friendships, that he supplied artists with drawings, that they uh, were able to work from his matrix and to continue to present essentially uh, Raphael originated works even after he had left uh, the city that they were working in. The same is not true in Florence. He does not build up those friendships and he does not have this kind of legacy of um, his style being um, presented after he leaves Florence. Now I want to look at the same situation, but the evidence of Rafa being outside of Florence. Well, before 1504, uh, and fitting into the absolutely standard chronology for Raphael's uh, life, we have various documents, and I've not tried to list them uh, one by one. They show him attending to family business in Urbino. There's an altarpiece contract for a picture um, supplied to the Church of Sant'Agostino in Città di Castello. And we see him acting as an agent for a merchant from Urbino in Perugia. Now, if I wanted to appoint somebody um, to act as my agent in Perugia, I think I would appoint somebody who lived there, somebody who was fixed and able to do the role I wanted them to perform. And that is how he is described in these documents. Moving forward in 1504, again, the documentary record is thin, but he does sign and date the wonderful Sposalizio um, from the Church of San Francesco in Città di Castello and now in the Brera. 1505, a time when we're now meant to believe that Raphael is based in Florence. What we actually find in December are contracts and payments in Perugia for him to paint an altarpiece for the Church of Santa Maria in Monteluce, delivered much, much later, almost 20 years later. Uh, and dates on two altarpieces, which I'll show, the Colonna and Antide altarpieces, both painted for Perugia. No documents placed Raphael in 1506. Uh, in 1507, we know that he's uh, in Urbino on family business, essentially, in late October. And then we have the uh, dated works already shown the entombment for Perugia and the small holy family with the lamb now in the Prado. 1508, we get a slightly better picture. Um, again, two works with dates mentioned at the bottom of this slide. And then a short note, undated, uh, but on the reverse of a drawing and talking quite clearly about links with Atalanta Baglioni and getting paid payment for the Baglioni entombment. In other words, we know that this is after the delivery of that work in 1507, um, and it's the, both the drawing and the, and the note are normally dated 1507 to 8. And here is the drawing that Raphael provided with to Alfani it's self-relevant for exactly this argument. He's maintaining links with his artists and supplying them with drawings from which they can execute works such as the um, finished picture here on the right-hand side. And then developing the same theme, um, after 1508, there are various um, 
records which show Raphael's continuing contact with artists from Perugia uh, and with the city, that he's accepting commissions there, he's renewing commissions there, he's in touch and sending drawings to the team of artists he worked with there. So what does this add up to in terms of non-Florentine works? Well, we have the Ancide altarpiece uh, in the National Gallery in London, dated 1505, for the Church of San Fiorenzo, Perugia. Uh, for the Church of San Severo in Perugia, he painted, uh, began this um, uh, trinity. Uh, it was later dated 1505 and later completed in its lower half by Perugino. Significantly, it was only completed after Raphael's death. In other words, in the long period when it was left un incomplete, they still hoped that Raphael would return and complete it. We have the so-called Colonna altarpiece from uh, the Church of St. Antonio uh, in Perugia, now in the Metropolitan Museum in New York. Here shown with a montage uh, showing its predella, which is spread across various North American and European collections. Uh, this picture we've seen, this picture we've seen. Uh, and then the great Baglioni entombment uh, now in the Borghese, signed and dated 1507. Now I mentioned uh, when we looked at the documents that Raphael did finally deliver the Monteluce coronation um, after the contract had been revised in 1516 in 1524, that is after his death, and it was delivered as a work by Raphael, together with his two workshop pupils, Giulio Romano and Gian Francesco Penny. Now, in addition to the works we know that were painted for, um, for instance, Perugia, but also Urbino, uh, there are works that seem to be from that environment rather than uh, a Florentine environment. They include the Bergamo St. Sebastian and the um, Norton Simon picture here on the right. Uh, the Madonna Conestabile painted for um, Perugia. The Madonna of the Pinks appears twice because there's a debate whether that was painted for Perugia or indeed for Florence. I put in a drawing, there aren't many of those. Um, and also a drawing for the Siege of Perugia, which um, plainly was not a Florentine commission. Um, Instead, it seems to have been an attempt to uh, replace the Bonfili frescoes in the chapel of, of the priors um, in Perugia. Now, I put in the end of this group, the Northbrook Madonna from Worcester, Massachusetts, um, to show a work by an Umbrian follower of Raphael, um, possibly Alfani, there are a number of other names that have been proposed, um, to suggest essentially how Raphael had this close following, people who were getting drawings from him and working with them. The same is true of Berto Di Giovanni, a collaborator in one of these contracts, uh, who is responding clearly to the Ancide altarpiece uh, in, in his own altarpiece of 1507, uh, which is now in the private chapel of, um, of Prince Charles. And to show Domenico Alfani receiving drawings at a later date. Uh, here is Raphael's drawing of the Macintosh Madonna in the British Museum. Uh, and on the left hand side, Alfani's altarpiece, uh, where he responds to this and, in fact, to two other Raphael drawings to do a kind of montage of his possibilities. And this is another um, Perugia document, unpublished, uh, showing uh, Raphael essentially being paid back a loan by uh, Bernardino di Lorenzo, um, the brother of Fiorenzo di Lorenzo. Now that's got, taken us through the documents for uh, activity in and out of Florence and the paintings in and out of Florence. The overall conclusion remains the same, but more important works have been painted elsewhere. Now why did we get to the position of thinking of Raphael as having a Florentine period? Well, the principal game changer was Giorgio Vasari's Lives of the Artists. 
1550 and most especially the 1568 edition. Vasari as a Tuscan writing in Florence for a Florentine uh, patron intended to give Florence a pivotal role in Raphael's career. Um, it's seen, it's presented as the city that turned him from his provincial ways uh, and made him into the artist he subsequently became. In addition, Vasari knew a great deal about Raphael's work in the city, um, much more than he was able to glean about his work in Perugia or Urbino or a number of other places. He knew the families of, um, uh, of patrons who had commissioned works from Raphael uh, and he could go and see them. Uh, Perugia did not have a figure of this type or rather Cesare Crispolti um, who wrote 98 years later than Vasari um, first in a manuscript uh, Raccolta delle cose segnalate di pettura che si ritrovano in Perugia, subsequently revised as Perugia Augusta. Um, he was essentially trying to remedy things describing what had happened in Perugia, but it was too late. It was 98 years too late. The pass had been sold. The Tuscan narrative was fully entrenched and the cultural appropriation of Raphael had begun. Or so the narrative seems to go. What actually happens if you look at Vasari's account is that you see quite quickly he does not describe a continuous period 1504 to 8. This has been lazy editing by later scholars who found it useful, easy, convenient to uh, label periods in a certain way. So let's now see what Vasari's chronology actually looks like. So Vasari presents how Raphael was working in Siena. He heard of the fame of what was happening with Leonardo and Michelangelo in competition in Florence and quotes, he put aside the project he was working on despite all its potential advantages and attractions and came to Florence. Once there, he was enthralled by the city, so he decided to prolong his stay. Abitare is the um, uh, verb used. He made friends with Tadeo today, already mentioned, um, and painted two pictures for him. He then makes a friendship with Lorenzo Nasi and makes a picture for him. That's the first three pictures I, I, I showed. I'm going to quote again. After finishing these three paintings, Raphael had to leave Florence for Urbino. In other words, it's a very short visit in, let's say, 1505. There's then a section describing what he did while he was living in Urbino. Having completed these works and settled his personal affairs in Urbino, Raphael returned to Perugia, not to Florence, to Perugia. And then we get a description of the works that he paints in, uh, in Perugia. So uh, I've mentioned these two and this, this is the first three, then he leaves. Now I've skipped over Urbino and we've gone to Perugia. And these are now mentioned one by one. The Ante altarpiece again, the San Severo fresco, the Colonna altarpiece in the Met, with particular reference to its predella. And then the Baglioni in two months, and I show here the montage of all the elements of this picture, as was done uh, in Borghese in 2008. Now, this picture comes in slightly later in the story. Um, the description is that while still in Perugia, Atalanta Baglioni implores Raphael to paint this picture for her. He says that he can't promise to do it then, he has to return to some commitments in Florence, uh, but that he would return to paint the picture. We then get a description of the Doni portraits, of the Canigiani uh, painting, 
a long description of what Raphael learned through studying and the friendship he developed with a number of young Florentine artists before we hear that Raphael was summoned back to Perugia where his first task was to complete the painting in the church of San Francesco having prepared the cartoon in Florence. Now just a small aside here uh, we don't have that cartoon we know it was based on a cartoon from technical studies of the picture there is this very beautiful large square drawing in the Uffizi, uh, almost certainly the last stage before a cartoon. And I think it is interesting that this was executed in Florence before Raphael had received a single Florentine altarpiece commission um, and that he did the cartoon here in Florence. There had been a recent tradition of showing cartoons before they were painted. Leonardo started it at Santa Spina Annunziata uh, with the Virgin and Child with St. Anne. And it was apparently a blockbuster event to see the Leonardo cartoon. Uh, my suspicion is that Raphael put particular energies to demonstrate what he'd learned from Florentine painting into this uh, cartoon that he probably showed it in Florence. Certainly Vasari seems to have known a lot about it being executed in Florence. Uh, and that this was a deliberate marketing move to try to break into some of the other high profile work that he was looking for. Either way, the description is that Raphael was summoned back to Perugia and that when in Perugia, he completes the painting, he then comes back to Florence starts on the day altarpiece, but he does not complete it because he's summoned to Rome. So that is where we get to with Vasari and the slightly complicated um, versions that follow from that. Uh, now, I've said what I want to say about this. I'm just going to pull a few thoughts together in conclusion, really. Um, It seems to me that Raphael did not come straight to Florence from Siena. He had too much to do in Perugia and elsewhere. Uh, that even if he visited, as he surely did in the course of 1505, that Perugia in that year remained the center of his operations. In 1506, he was probably in Florence for some months, but we know he's called back to Urbino and we know that he has further commitments then in Perugia. We don't see any of the things that we see elsewhere in his activity. The renting or purchasing of property or a workshop, major public commissions, appearing as a witness or an agent, development of long-term relationships with a um, cohort of artists. We don't see this in Florence, we do see it elsewhere. So if there wasn't a Florentine period as such, what was Raphael's relationship with the city? When did it occur and how long did it, how, how did it, how long did it last? Well, I hope to have just outlined what I think that uh, looked like. The one thing I haven't done and what I've been trying to do here is to present Raphael's studies in Florence. It's quite clear from that original letter of presentation that he came to Florence in order to study. Uh, that involved him in getting to know both Leonardo and Michelangelo, to study the works of uh, other Florentine painters alive and uh, painters and sculptors alive and dead, um, and that he learned enormously from that experience. I'm not diminishing the impact that Florence had on Raphael's career. I just think we ought to be a little bit more cautious in how we describe his activities in the years 1504 to eight. And if I just end with this slide, which is publicity for the exhibition I co-curated with David Exurgeon for the National Gallery London, now postponed until these new dates shown on the screen, opening on the 10th of March, 2022 running until the middle of June. Um, 
we will not do as the Scuderia del Quirinale has done in their most recent show where they reverse the chronology of Raphael's life. We will instead take Raphael's life chronologically. But when we get to the years 1504 to eight, we will not be presenting that as Raphael's Florentine period. We'll be presenting what he did in the range of different locations in which he did it. <laughs>